The objective of this problem is to determine the design capacity of column AB shown in the frame below. All steel is A992, all column bases are pinned, and the column is oriented such that it is bent about its strong axis as shown in the figure. The frame is unbraced in the plane shown, so we'll use alignment charts to determine K for strong axis buckling. However, we'll assume that the frame is braced in the perpendicular direction and take K equal to 1 for weak axis buckling. A detail of the connections between the beams and the column at joint A is provided as well. If you haven't already watched it, check out my lecture on the basis of the effective length factors, link shown here, and check for links of associated videos in the comment section below. Let's get started. The first step in determining the effective length factor for strong axis buckling is to determine the joint stiffness ratios G. G is equal to the sum of I over L for the columns framing into the joint divided by the sum of I over L for the girders framing into the joint. The lengths of the members are given in the sketch, but we'll need to look up the members' moments of inertia in the steel construction manual. It's given in the problem statement that all members are bent about their strong axes in the plane of the frame. Thus, we'll need to find the strong axis or x-axis moment of inertia. For the W24 by 84, I sub X is equal to 2370 inches to the fourth, and for the W21 by 62, I sub X is equal to 1330 inches to the fourth. For the W12 by 152, we find that I sub X is equal to 1430 inches to the fourth. With that, we can calculate the joint stiffness ratio G sub A. There are two columns framing into joint A, one from above with a length of 14 feet and one from below with a length of 18 feet, both with a moment of inertia of 1430 inches to the fourth. There are also two beams framing into joint A, one from the left with a moment of inertia of 2370 inches to the fourth and a length of 40 feet, and one from the right with a moment of inertia of 1330 inches to the fourth and a length of 30 feet. The stiffness of the beam framing in from the right is not considered at all, however, because it isn't rigidly connected to the column under consideration. If we look at the detail of the connection, we can see that the W24 by 84 framing in from the left is rigidly connected because the flanges of the beam are connected to the column. But since the flanges of the W21 by 62 framing in from the right are not connected to the column, we treat that connection as pinned and we don't consider the W21 by 62 stiffness when we calculate the joint stiffness ratio. In the end, the stiffness ratio for joint A is equal to 3.065. Next, we consider the stiffness ratio for joint B, the pin base of the column. In this case, we have one column framing into that joint, but there aren't any beams or girders framing into the joint. One way to handle this situation is to account for the column stiffness in the numerator of the joint stiffness ratio, and then use a value of zero in the denominator to account for the lack of rotational restraint at the pin support. In this case, we would end up with a theoretical stiffness ratio for joint B equal to infinity. The effective length method is covered in Appendix 7 of the 2022 edition of the AISC specification. The alignment charts that we're going to use to determine the effective length factors are found in the commentary to Appendix 7. If we read through that commentary, we can find that the cases of pinned and fixed spaces are addressed directly. Specifically, the commentary says that for column ends supported by, but not rigidly connected to, a footing or foundation, G is theoretically infinity, but unless designed as a true friction-free pin, may be taken as 10 for practical designs. So we'll take G as 10.0 for the pin base at joint B. Now that we know that G sub A and G sub B are 3.065 and 10.0 respectively, we can determine the effective length factor for column AB. First, I'll use the alignment chart by drawing a straight line from 3.065 on one side to 10.0 on the other. Then we can see that K is approximately equal to 2.3 based on where that line crosses the center axis. 
Alternatively, we can use the equation to calculate k, and in this case, find that k is equal to 2.300. I'll use k equal to 2.300 later on in this example when I calculate the strength of the column. As a first step in calculating the available strength of the column, I'll check the flanges and web of the W12 by 152 to see if they're classified as slender or non-slender for compression. For the flanges, we have B sub F over 2T sub F equal to 4.46, and for the web, we have H over T sub W equal to 11.2. We can find these values tabulated in part one of the AISC manual. Looking at the W12 by 152, we see that B sub F over 2T sub F is tabulated as 4.46, and that H over T sub W is tabulated as 11.2. The limiting values of lambda sub r are found in table B4.1a of the AISC specification. Case 1 applies to the flanges, and case 5 applies to the webs of rolled I-shaped sections. Zooming in a bit, we see that lambda sub r is equal to 0.56 times the square root of v over f sub y for the flanges, and that lambda sub r is equal to 1.49 times the square root of e over f sub y for the web. We can now calculate values for lambda sub r and find that lambda sub r is equal to 13.5 for the flanges and lambda sub r is equal to 35.9 for the web. Thus, we can determine that the flanges and the web are non-slender for steel with a yield stress of 50 KSI. Now that we know the effective link factors and we know that the section is non-slender, the next step is to calculate the flexural buckling strength. The flexural buckling strength is a function of the governing slenderness ratio for the column. Thus, we need to calculate the slenderness ratios for both the strong axis and the weak axis to see which axis will control buckling. We'll need the radii of gyration for the W12 by 152. From the AISC steel construction manual, we find that R sub X is equal to 5.66 inches and that R sub Y is equal to 3.19 inches. Using R sub X of 5.66 inches and K sub X equal to 2.3, we can find that the slenderness ratio for strong axis buckling is 87.77. Using R sub Y of 3.19 inches and K sub Y equal to 1.0, we can find that the slenderness ratio for weak axis buckling is 67.71. Both of these values are less than 200, as is required in Chapter E of the AISC specification, and we note that the strong axis buckling governs since KL over R is larger for the X axis than it is for the Y axis. Now that we have the governing value of KL over R, we can calculate the flexural buckling strength. 4.71 times the square root of E over F sub Y is equal to 113.4. And since KL over R is less than 4.71 times the square root of E over F sub Y, F critical is equal to 0 0.658 to the F sub Y divided by F sub E power times F sub Y. F sub E is equal to pi squared times E divided by KL over R squared. Substituting in a value of 87.77 for KL over R, we find that F sub E is equal to 37.15 KSI. And then it works out that F subcritical is equal to 28.47 KSI. Next, the nominal capacity P sub N is equal to F critical times A sub G. Referring again to the AISC steel construction manual, we find that the gross area of the W12 by 152 is 44.7 inches squared. With that, we can calculate the nominal strength of the column as 1,272 kips, and then find that the design strength, phi times phi sub n, is equal to 1,145 kips. Alternatively, once we know the effective length factors, we can use the design tables in Chapter 4 of the AISC Steel Construction Manual to determine the available strength of the column. We find the available strength of the W12 by 152 tabulated for 50 KSI steel on page 4-19 of the manual. 
We have to be a bit careful when looking up column strengths in the AISC steel construction manual. The 16th edition of the manual includes tabulated strengths for W shapes in three different grades of steel. Grade 50 steel in table 4-1A, grade 65 steel in table 4-1B, and grade 70 steel in table 4-1C. For this example, we want the W12 by 152 with F sub Y equal 50 KSI, which is on page 4-19. Zooming in a bit and confirming that we are looking at the table for the correct grade of material, we can start off by checking strong axis buckling. With K sub X equal to 2.3 and L equal to 18 feet, we find that the effective length with respect to strong axis buckling is 41.40 feet. The available strength is tabulated as a function of the effective length with respect to the weak axis radius of gyration, however, so we have to calculate a fictitious value, KL sub X, for use in the table that is equal to the actual value of KL sub X divided by the ratio of R sub X to R sub Y. We can find the ratio of R sub X to R sub Y tabulated as 1.77. So we can see that KL sub X for use in the table works out to be equal to 23.39 feet. Since available strength isn't tabulated for an effective length of 23.39 feet, we'll start by looking up the strength for the next larger effective length that is tabulated. For KL equal to 24 feet, we see that the available strength V times P sub N is tabulated as 1110 kips. For most cases, using this value will be sufficiently accurate. However, we are permitted to interpolate between rows in the table. For KL equal to 22 feet, we can see that the available strength V times P sub N is tabulated as 1220 kips. Interpolating between these two values for an effective length of 23.39 feet, we find an available strength V times P sub N of 1144 kips, which agrees well with our previous calculations. Next, we'll check weak axis buckling. With K sub Y equal to 1 and L equal to 18 feet, the effective length with respect to weak axis buckling is 18 feet. At this point, since the value of KL sub X that we calculated for use in the table, 23.39 feet, is larger than KL sub Y, we can determine that X axis or strong axis buckling will govern. This is usually sufficient for most problems. However, if we want to, we can look up the available strength associated with weak axis buckling and find that it is equal to 1440 kips. So the final answer is that strong axis buckling governs and the available strength of the W12 by 152 in grade 50 steel is 1140 kips. In summary, we determined that the effective length factor K sub X associated with strong axis buckling of column AB is 2.30 and that the available strength phi times P sub N of column AB is 1140 kips. Thanks for watching and make sure to check out other videos that I have posted.